All right, thanks Dr. Knight for the introduction. Um, I'm Michael Asando, I'm from Ohio State University, the Ohio State University. Uh, I'm gonna discuss anesthetic options for patients uh, undergoing SICD implantation and further go into uh, the best practices for pain control. I have the following disclosures, but uh, you know, as listed you know, on the slide. Um, and I'll get to the objectives. So the main objectives are, you know, I would spend a few minutes on current implant, you know, techniques. Uh, Dr. Winter will go more into the surgical, you know, uh, aspects of implantation. And then I would, you know, discuss, you know, contemporary anesthetic approaches for SICD implantation and specifically pay attention to the limitations of all the contemporary approaches. And then further go into pain management approaches and how we can uh, provide an enhanced recovery for these patients who are, you know, very sick uh, and need defibrillators. So it's best to get them out of the hospital sooner than, you know, later. So why is the SICD important? Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Knight discussed this, but it's for patients who need, you know, shock therapy for uh, to prevent sudden cardiac death. Uh, those with, you know, uh, chronic venous occlusions, those at high risk for infections. And the SICD has shown to be effective and, you know, pretty comparable to uh, the conventional transvenous, you know, uh, device. Uh, there are contemporary implantation techniques. Uh, the three incision technique, which, you know, was, it has been, you know, used and still being used by, you know, a lot of implanters. Then we have the two incision approach, uh, which was initially reported by Dr. Knopsis group in Amsterdam. And then, uh, one incision approach was recently published in PACE uh, by Dr. Durat's group, where they used just the pulse generator site uh, as their main you know, incision, and then they tunneled the lead substernally from this uh, uh, from the pulse generator site. And then the intermuscular approach, uh, Dr. Winter published uh, his experience with the intermuscular approach. Uh, basically, that provides a very posterior positioning of the pulse generator. Uh, and it improves the efficacy of shock therapy uh, as seen in the, you know, in the image on the right. And uh, um, you can see that the, you know, the serratus anterior and the latissimus dorsi uh, here and here uh, sandwich the pulse generator and it creates a great location and limits uh, erosions, especially in patients with, uh, you know, very low BMI. So why is anesthesia and, um, you know, sedation, analgesia, and anesthesia important for the SICD, you know, patient? Um, so it's, you know, different from the conventional approach, there is a lot of dissection, regardless of the approach being used, whether it's intermuscular, submuscular, subcutaneous, one incision, two incision, three incision, there is significant dissection in the anterior chest wall of a patient. And further, during defibrillation testing, which, you know, is is different from the transvenous population where most do not undergo DFT testing. Uh, you're going to use a 50 hertz, you know, best burst energy, 200 milliamps, and that leads to significant muscle contraction, uh, a lot of nerve, you know, activation. So there's some aspect of, you know, pain that is, you know, produced uh, during DFT implantation and, you know, lead tunnel. So just going back anatomically, the reason that, you know, uh, nerves, the nerves in the chest wall play an important role is the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves T2 to T9, they supply the pulse generator in a region. And in this, you know, diagram, you can, you know, even though it doesn't show the exact, you know, innovation, there is a whole wealth of nerves that really get injured during surgical dissection. And then during persternal tunneling, the anterior cutaneous branches of T2 to T6 also get, you know, damaged. So these are the main reasons why patients do well, you know, during the operating room in a uh, setting, then they go to the floor, you send them home, and then they call complaining of significant, you know, pain. So what are the anesthetic approaches available? So uh, general anesthesia, monitored anesthesia care, uh, procedureless administered sedation and analgesia and truncal plane blocks are the most reported in the literature, and we'll go over each in the next few slides. 
So general anesthesia was, is the most used for SICD implantation from both the ID study, effortless, and post-approval studies. Over 60% of implants are done with general anesthesia. Uh, but the benefits of general anesthesia is it's great for the, you know, the learning curve phase so the implanter does not have to focus on the management of the patient's hemodynamics. Uh, and then they can learn about the technical aspects of SICD implantation, which is very different from, you know, what they are used to in the transmitter space. Uh, but it's not always good for all, you know, SICD patients because a lot of these patients have significant cardiovascular disease, low ejection fractions, they are on vasodilator therapy, and they also are uh, on beta blockers suppressing sympathetic activity. Uh, one of the problems that, you know, we run through a lot in the EP lab is it's hard to get anesthesia to come down to the EP lab because a lot of times we don't have, the EP lab does not have enough cases, uh, you know, to sustain having multiple anesthesia teams, and it prolongs the utilization times in the EP labs. And then there are risks associated with general anesthesia, such as airway injury, and most importantly, uh, sympathetic suppression of the cardiovascular system uh, supply in the heart. And then post of nausea vomiting also keeps patients in the, in the hospital longer than they should be. Uh, we looked at, you know, our general anesthesia uh, use for SICD implantation in a small study at Ohio State University, and it was interesting to find that over 50% of patients develops uh, significant hypotension and bradycardia and required, you know, vasopressor or inotrope therapy. So it's, you know, based on our, you know, uh, analysis, it just seemed that, you know, having a, an anesthetic that spends the sympathetic nervous system may be beneficial for SICD patients. So we trialed monitored anesthesia care, which is basically a service provided by anesthesiologists. It can range from sedation to general anesthesia, uh, but the most important aspects are, you know, there has to be monitoring of the depth of sedation, hemodynamics, uh, respiratory parameters, and oxygenation. And we, we looked at, it was 10 patients, we predominantly used propofol infusion, and lidocaine was administered in the pulse generator pocket, and, you know, all the, you know, standard, you know, monitoring. And our outcomes showed that um, mitral anesthesia was safe and effective. We did not have any patients that needed to be transitioned to general anesthesia. And in the first, you know, few hours after surgery, they had adequate pain control, but their pain requirements for narcotics was really high after 12 hours, which showed that we don't have a good strategy for pain control for the SICD patient, even using uh, monitored anesthesia care. And just one other uh, point here is that most of our, you know, implants were using lidocaine, which has a quick onset but a very short, you know, um, efficacy for, you know, long-term pain control. So uh, the other anesthetic approach is the non anesthesiologist administered sedation and analgesia. It's been used in Europe. Uh, in our U.S. experience, over 30% of the post-approval uh, population were done with this approach. Uh, it requires uh, that the, the, the institution has to, or the implanter has to be well-educated on the, you know, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the sedatives. And it also depends on the institutional and the state regulations uh, regarding, you know, sedation uh, administration. Uh, very important points regarding, you know, the non-anesthesiologist administered sedation approach. Uh, the, the implanter has to pay attention to you know, the physical examination. You have to know the airway exam. And you have to pick candidates that are not at high risk for potential cardiovascular and respiratory, you know, uh, collapse. Uh, monitoring that has to be used, there are electrocontinuous uh, electrocardiogram, uh, blood pressure monitoring, and audible, you know, pulse oximetry. So everybody in the EP lab can, you know, pay attention to the oxygenation and the heart rate of the patient. And then continuous capnography is very important. And one of the vital point is the need for a dedicated staff who would be monitoring the patient because the implant would be focusing on the, the procedure. So this approach was used in Europe, uh, Dr. Perro's group. Uh, they use uh, predominantly midazolam and nobopin. And then post-procedure, they reversed uh, midazolam's effect with fluazinol. The patients did well, but it was important to, you know, to kind of pay attention to the fact that patients with severe pulmonary disease 
and those on chronic opioids were excluded in their um, study. Uh, they, they basically found this to be great. Pain control was adequate, uh, but once again, there's a high opioid requirement. So from the, you know, the three, you know, approaches described, implantation is great, but post-op pain is not well covered. So truncal plane blocks were, you know, these are blocks being used for breast surgery, and they've been, they, you know, Dr. Miller's group has done a great job in Mount Sinai of bringing these blocks into the EP lab. So these truncal plane blocks are, you know, fascial plane blocks where you inject local anesthetic um, in the pulse generator region, you know, targeting, you know, the serratus anterior plane block is between the serratus anterior um, muscle and latissimus dorsi. And then the transversus thoracic plane block would be for the personal tunneling region. So this is, you know, an image from Dr. Miller's, you know, paper. Uh, you can see, you know, they, they, they implant the kind of, you know, picks out the area that they're going to implant the pulse generator so you can do the block within that region. And then the parasternal block area would be, you know, the transversus thoracic plane, you know, block. So it's done, you know, uh, by anesthesiologist, ultrasound guided. It's a pretty quick block. And they perform theirs in the, you know, the procedure room, um, you know, prior, you know, the, the most important thing is to do the block closer to the time of implantation. So if it's if the block is done in the preoperative area and there's a delay in the operating room, then that's you know limits the efficacy for post-procedure pain control. So just a description of their study, it was, you know, they, they looked at the feasibility, safety, and efficacy of these truncal plane blocks. And they also added a multimodal analgesia strategy, which is being used in thoracic surgery and other surgical approaches to enhance in a rapid recovery of patients. So it was two groups of patients, uh, the general anesthesia group and the deep sedation group, they all were, you know, they received truncal plane blocks, but uh, the, the, the variability was uh, the, the deep sedation group received pretreatment with, you know, Tylenol, and they also received uh, gabapentin. It was a 600 milligram dose. And then they received deep sedation with a combination of propofol and dexmedetomidine. Um, and then they did the truncal plane blocks and post-procedure, you know, based on their GFR, uh, they were either given, you know, uh, Ketorolac, and they also received lidocaine, you know, at the incision site. And in the post-op office, uh, they all stayed in-house, you know, uh, overnight. They received Ketorolac and, you know, oxycodone with acetaminophen. The general anesthesia group, they received truncal plane block, but did not receive all the other multimodal analgesic, you know, drugs. And they found that the need for post-procedure opioids was, you know, in the first 12 hours was zero in the deep sedation uh, group with the multimodal strategy in comparison to the general anesthesia group, even though they received a truncal plane block. And after, you know, from zero to 24 hours, it was very significantly different between the groups. So their study showed that the truncal plane blocks are very effective for pain control, but adding a multimodal analgesic strategy to the truncal plane blocks may be the best approach for, you know, analgesia. So to take on points uh, from, you know, uh, our experience and all the other global experiences is the the intraoperative, intraprocedure anesthetic strategy for SICD uh, implantation, uh, there's not one anesthetic that fits every patient. Uh, general anesthesia works well, but we have to be mindful of the negative cardiovascular uh, complications that can, you know, come with general anesthesia. Monitored anesthesia care is sympathetic sparing. However, there's airway uh, complications that can come with it. Bronchial plane blocks are great. Uh, but they require deep sedation, and they are very useful for, you know, post-procedure pain control. And the non-anesthesiologist administered sedation and analgesia is also a great approach, but requires, you know, optimal patient, you know, selection. So um, for pain control, I think the best strategy is to adopt a multimodal uh, opioid sparing approach. 
uh, acetaminophen preoperatively is a great, you know, drug to administer. Gabapentin is great. Um, it's new to the EP lab, so we have to be mindful that it also has sedative properties. So using one dose for every patient is not ideal. It should be dosed based on weight and GFR. Uh, preemptive analgesic strategy with, you know, oxycodone is great. The use of truncoplain blocks would basically reduce the need for all the other, you know, uh, analgesics. And if the patient's GFR would tolerate, uh, Ketorolac or, you know, any NSAID would be, you know, ideal. So in summary, um, you know, based on the evidence available and our personal experience, um, you know, there are multiple anesthetic strategies that are safe and effective. Um, general anesthesia is a great approach when you're learning how to really, you know, implant the SICD. So the electrophysiologist does not have to worry too much about, you know, the management of sedation and hemodynamics. Uh, but after you get comfortable with, you know, the implantation, uh, MAC or NASA with the truncal plane blocks are great approaches that would help with early discharge of the patients. Uh, but regardless, the multimodal analgesic approach, regardless of the type of anesthetic, you know, adopted, would, it's very useful uh, for early recovery. And it's best to choose the anesthetic that fits the patient and, you know, the resources in your program. Thank you. That was outstanding. That was uh, very interesting and enlightening. This uh, truncal block issue was uh, new to us. We have yet to um, do that. Would you say that if we were to talk to an anesthesiologist, would you talk to the people who do a lot of local blocks? There's, you know, there's regional anesthesiologists versus cardiac anesthesiologists. Who would be the best person to approach in your hospital? Perfect. So um, we have, like similar to most of the, you know, uh, large academic centers, we have a regional anesthesia team who have been administering these blocks for breast resections. Uh, it's actually being used also for patients who come in with, you know, uh, rib injury, uh, for pain control in the anterior and anterior lateral chest wall. So they are not new blocks. Uh, a lot of cardiac and general anesthesiologists may not be as conversant with it. Uh, it's an ultrasound administered block. It takes a few minutes. And learning uh, how to perform this block takes maybe five to ten, you know, uh, hands-on blocks, and then you become effective with it. Uh, but the, the so it, it with regards to the EP lab, it would not slow down, you know, the flow through of patients, you know, coming for SICD implantation, but it, it really would significantly reduce the opioid requirements, which was you know, demonstrated in Dr. Miller's study. I understand it's one center, but it's been used in other surgical approaches, even in, you know, thoracic surgery, where they spread the ribs apart. So if we can limit, you know, if you can do a preemptive analgesic strategy of doing these blocks prior to, you know, surgical dissection, uh, you know, causing injury to the anacostals, it will be really great for the safety and efficacy of, you know, um, anesthesia care of SICD patients. It's helpful. We'll, we'll have to consider that ourselves. Uh, Michael, a question from Charles Slater. How many days do you keep uh, Tylenol and gabapentin before and after the procedure? Uh, perfect. So uh, most eat, uh, in most areas, enhanced recovery protocols, uh, administer just one dose of gabapentin, uh, you know, which Dr. Miller's study, everybody receives 600 milligrams, but when you look at thoracic surgery and other experiences, it's variable based on the GFR and, you know, the other sedatives that a patient is receiving. But the traditional approach is just one dose of gabapentin. Uh, the Tylenol, you know, they can be on Tylenol for a few days, similar to any other approach regarding, you know, uh, acetaminophen. And if applicable, it would also be great to add, you know, an NSAID, you know, to it. And that would collectively, these multimodal, analgesic strategies reduce the need for opioids.